Hello, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's streaming only History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackleford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We are working safely with the skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Mississippi Muse I mean the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Tune in to the Museum of Mississippi History's Facebook page at noon tomorrow for a streaming program about women's suffrage in Mississippi. Marjorie J. Spruill, Distinguished Professor Emerita at the University of South Carolina, will discuss the legacies of Reconstruction, reforms of the Progressive Era, and the white supremacist attitudes of Mississippi's early suffragettes, such as Nellie Nugent Somerville and Belle Kearney. While we did not plan it this way, and, and while I think this is the first time our speaker is actually hearing it, that fits hand in glove with today's presentation. There's a quote from Belle Kearney that um, is right on point for that. Finally, I hope that you'll join us next week for History is Lunch, when University Press of Mississippi author J. Richard Gruber will present Dusty Bonger, Art and Life. Today, we're happy to welcome Michael J. Goldman to present History and Mississippi's Lost Cause. Goldman earned a BA in History from Westminster College in Salt Lake City and an MA and PhD in United States History from Mississippi State University. He teaches at Somerset Community College in Kentucky and serves as Chair of the Department of Humanities, Fine Arts, and Social Sciences. His first book, Your Heritage Will Still Remain, Racial Identity and Mississippi's Lost Cause was published by University Press of Mississippi in 2017. Mike will join us via Zoom from Kentucky, then we'll cue his pre-recorded presentation. When that's over, we'll bring him back on for a live question and answer session. You can ask any questions you may have of Mike in the comments of this video, and I'll pass those on to him at the appropriate time. And now, here's Michael Goldman. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the opportunity to um, speak to you today. Uh, it's pre-recorded, but uh, still uh, being able to present uh, a little bit about the research that I did. Um, the um, presentation that, that I prepared actually comes from the last chapter of the book, so it, I guess it's kind of a spoiler uh, to, to the entirety of the book, but um, it's, it's a, a topic that I think is, is still very timely. Uh, we've, we've seen um, the impact of uh, the lost cause and, and how it continues to influence uh, racial issues and tensions within today's society. So uh, please feel free to ask questions, um, as, as Chris said in, in, the, in the comments in the chat, and be more than happy to uh, address those. And so we'll go ahead and uh, get that presentation up and playing for you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Willman, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you for the next few minutes about Mississippi's lost cause. I want to thank Chris Goodwin for extending the invitation and to all the staff and personnel who work on the History is Lunch program. Please indulge me for a moment as I share with you some of my personal background. I have roots in Mississippi. My dad grew up in Darwin. I'm assuming most of you probably have no idea where Darwin is located. If you pull up Darwin in Google Maps and click on the icon, it shows a picture of the side of Darwin Road, complete with dead grass and a slew of trees in the background. Besides a smattering of small churches and a general store, Darwin is just a small rural community west of Columbia and north of Tylertown in the southern part of the state. My dad left Mississippi for Salt Lake City, Utah when he was 18. I was born in Salt Lake City and lived there for most of my pre-adult life. We did move to Mississippi for a year when I was around two, but we ended up back out west. I grew up knowing about my Southern roots and being proud of having that connection. On New Year's Day, we always had a Southern meal, which consisted of red beans and rice, okra, black eyed peas, and cornbread. I ate other things that my friends never heard of, like grits, fried okra, cornbread and milk, literally cornbread submerged in a cup of milk, frog legs, and boiled peanuts. My dad had lost his accent, but he did say weird things on occasion that I didn't understand. 
like it's hotter than a nanny goat in a pepper patch eating two rows at a time. I still have no idea what that means. As I entered the final stages of my undergraduate education, I took a class called Slavery in the Civil War. My professor devoted the first half of the semester to the study of American slavery. I became fascinated with its history and the daily lives of the enslaved. I admired the courage and the resolute nature of enslaved Americans and was also astounded at the awful condition they endured. As I started thinking about graduate school, I decided that if I wanted to continue studying slavery, it would make sense to choose an institution in the South. My family roots drew me to Mississippi, where I eventually settled on Mississippi State University to pursue my master's and PhD in United States history. After moving to Starkville, it didn't take long for me to recognize that I truly did not understand my Southern roots. In fact, what I experienced in Mississippi was quite foreign to my Intermountain West upbringing. As I studied Southern history and experienced living in the South, I became interested in why the South was so peculiar. How is it possible that a state known for its hospitality and friendliness could have such a dark history? How is it possible that segregation still existed in the 21st century? Why did white Southerners cling so passionately to a past that was largely fabricated and romanticized? As I continued to study, I started delving more into antebellum social and racial interactions in Mississippi and the process of group identity formation. I would like to share with you some of my research as I focus specifically on the creation of Mississippi's lost cause, and in particular, how white Mississippians wrote their history as a way to preserve a virtuous and positive identity for future generations. The formation of Mississippi's lost cause was not happenstance, but rather a concerted effort to minimize all the faults, deformities, and horrors of Mississippi's past and replace it with the veneer of self-aggrandized virtue and honor. The process, however, came at the expense of Black Mississippians. In the aftermath of the Civil War, white Southerners sought to make sense of the conflict and their defeat, and in the process created what historians refer to as the lost cause. Historian Edward Crowther succinctly defined the lost cause as, quote, the ideas, symbols and rituals that sought to vindicate the antebellum South and the Confederate war that was fought to preserve it, end quote. In 1866, author and journalist Edwin Alfred Pollard published a book titled The Lost Cause, a Southern History, a New Southern History of the War of the Confederates, in which he sought to understand the war and its outcome. Within his book, Pollard introduced four major themes, which would comprise the basis for the legend of the lost cause. First, that slavery had little to do with the conflict. Rather, sectional disputes played a much larger role. While Pollard recognized the disputes over slavery, later authors would argue that white Southerners did not fight the war to preserve slavery, nor did the slave issue have any bearing on the precipitous events leading to the outbreak of the war. Second, Pollard argued that the issue of states' rights formed the immediate cause for the rupture between the northern and southern states. Pollard claimed that the war centered on disagreements over political philosophy, with northerners advocating for greater federalization and southerners wishing to retain the founders' vision of state sovereignty. Third, Pollard excoriated Abraham Lincoln as the manifestation of Northern efforts to impose abolitionism, strip white Southerners of their property rights, and subject the South to the will of the North. Fourth, Pollard praised the valor and virtue of Confederate military leaders as men superior in both character, strength, and intelligence to their Northern counterparts. Men such as Robert E. Lee, symbolized the genteel white Southerner who fought to defend his homeland against invasion. In addition, Confederate soldiers performed their duties with valor and esteem greater than any in world history. Their defeat resulted only because of Northern numerical superiority. 
Over the course of Reconstruction and beyond, white Southerners would elaborate on these themes to create a lost cause legend that extolled the virtue of the Old South, defended their actions during the secession crisis and civil war, and portrayed themselves as victims of Northern machinations during the period of Reconstruction. Like the South's lost cause, Mississippi's lost cause was rooted in white supremacy, which has persisted as the core tenet over the course of the 20th and into the 21st century. White Mississippians in the late 19th and early 20th centuries would use history as a way to propel the lost cause and to ensure future generations would adopt their vision and interpretation of historical events that cast a positive light on white Mississippians. Keep in mind that the lost cause is rooted in distorted historical events. The perception that white Mississippians wanted to convey was a positive image or identity that minimized the sins of the South. Many white Southerners continue to recognize lost cause themes as historical fact. The danger in doing so is that the lost cause comes at the expense of black Southerners and continues to perpetuate a false narrative that ignores the responsibility of white Southerners in committing some horrific acts. The lost cause minimizes the actions of white Southerners in causing the Civil War for the purpose of preserving slavery. The lost cause excuses slaveholding and tries to justify its existence as a positive good for slaveholders and slaves. The lost cause ignores the poor decisions and at times incompetence of Confederate government officials, including Southern military leaders who also made some questionable decisions. The lost cause makes excuses for white resistance to reconstruction following the war. Resistance, which included granting black Americans full rights of citizenship and the right of black males to vote. The lost cause justifies the existence of the Ku Klux Klan claiming it was a noble endeavor to save the South from the ravages of marauding black men intent on defiling Southern white women. The lost cause memorializes Confederate military leaders as noble Americans, forgetting or ignoring the fact that these men committed treason by fighting against the United States. The lost cause endorses white supremacy and the symbols associated with it. The lost cause made it easy for white Mississippians to rationalize the lynching of African Americans, resulting in a reign of terror during the 1880s and 1890s, with the state of Mississippi averaging nearly two lynching deaths a month at its peak. The lost cause has persisted to the point where fiction continues to blur fact, where symbols of the Confederacy and white supremacy are regarded as artifacts of a noble heritage. Perhaps most importantly, the lost cause has prevented white Southerners from coming to terms with its past. Today's generation does not need to be saddled or held responsible for the actions of their ancestors. Our ancestors made their own decisions, good and bad, and lived their lives in accordance with the standards and morals of the time. But recognition of the past can pave the way for a better path forward toward healing, understanding, and greater empathy for all people. As white Mississippians wrote their histories, whether as memoirs, in journals, oral histories, or as published historical accounts, they held firm to the doctrine of the lost cause with very little digression from it. In doing so, they hoped to fashion a positive social identity for posterity. Social scientists argue that the creation of a positive group construct or identity generally happens in concerts with labeling another group with negative characteristics. Thus, to maintain their positive group identity, white Mississippians needed to suppress, control, condemn, or vilify the identity of another group. This cartoon by Tom Galt summarizes uh, this idea of positive identity formation in contrast to uh, an, another group or an outgroup. So here we have a picture of two societies that are exactly the same. However, how they're labeled is different. On the left, uh, under Blessed Homeland, we have a glorious leader, a great religion, a noble populace, and heroic adventurers. <clears throat> 
Yet they label the society that's exactly the same as theirs as being much different. That they have a wicked despot. That they have a primitive superstition for religion. That they're backward savages. That they're brutish invaders. Rather than continue to denounce the North for perceived injustices or for those negative characteristics, with those negative characteristics, white Mississippians would eventually turn their ire in even greater measure against the Black population. Unfortunately, over time, the rest of the nation accepted the tropes of the lost cause and embraced the social identity constructs created by white Southerners that defined the white Southern population as well as the Black Southern population. While not helpless, Black Americans fostered their own group identity based on their own constructs, but found that the rest of the country adopted the narrative concocted by white Southerners. As I give examples of lost cause writing, please understand that I will not take the time to do a lot of myth busting. Hopefully those listening will be able to recognize and understand the exaggerations, denials, and contradictions inherent in these historical writings. For many, the writings will probably sound familiar to what they heard growing up or were taught as part of their history. Most of the historical writings I will discuss come from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Many of them were written following the end of Reconstruction. It was a time when white Mississippians sought to reassert political and social control over the black population of the state. It was during this time that lawmakers in the state enacted segregation laws and voter restriction laws to, rep to repress black Mississippians. It is also important to keep in mind that public lynching occurred frequently without excuse or apology. It is also during this period that white Mississippians erected a majority of the Confederate monuments and memorials in the state, most occurring in the early 20th century. In their writings, white Mississippians venerated the Old South as the high watermark of pure and virtuous civilization. Historian Dunbar Rowland stated that from, quote, 1817 to 1861, Mississippi was a garden for the cultivation of all that was grand in oratory, true in science, sublime and beautiful in poetry and sentiment and enlightenment and profound in law and statesmanship. End quote. Belle Kearney, daughter of a plantation owner, proudly declared that prior to the war, quote, the South was in its glory. It was rich and very proud. Its wealth consisted of slaves and plantations. The life of the great landowners and slaveholders resembled that of the old feudal lords, end quote. History writers echoed common tropes of the cavalier myth which claimed that aristocratic nobles populated the Southern states during its infancy. These narratives waxed nostalgically about the Old South as a place full of genteel men and women who spent their days in opulence and refinement. Of course, the truth in the antebellum South was much different. Less than 50% of white Mississippians owned slaves, and most of those non-slaveholders lived near poverty levels. The great plantation owners were rare and comprised roughly 1% of the population. Lost cause writers ignored or downplayed the plight of black Americans and instead justified and celebrated slavery as a positive good for both white and black. Descriptions of slavery purposefully ignored the cruel nature of the institution and the horrors experienced by those enslaved. Instead, white Mississippians spoke of slavery without any hint of reservation and emphatically endorsed and defended keeping human beings in bondage. J.M. Gibson explained that, quote, throughout the nation outside the Deep South, there was a common belief that the owners treated their slaves with great cruelty, drove them in their work through long hours in all kinds of weather, provided few clothes and seldom shoes to wear and force them to occupy unsanitary huts, end quote. Despite this perception, Gibson claimed that the slaves, quote, were well-fed and comfortably clothed and given good shoes and boots. The women were not compelled to do heavy work, and no child under 12 years was made to work in the fields 
or elsewhere other than to carry water or milk to filled hands, end quote. Of course, in reality, the conditions of slaves was miserable. They worked long hours in the sweltering heat and humidity, faced cruel punishment for disobedience or at the whim of their master, had family members sold away at a moment's notice, and lived in single room cabins. When it came to writing about the causes of the Civil War, Lost Cause writers noted that secession resulted from Northern aggressions and injustices designed to subject the South. Many argued that they did not want to secede, but Northern abolitionist irritants and the Northern commitment to abolishing slavery resulted in a reluctant severing of the ties that bound the Union. Annie Harper stated that Abraham Lincoln, following his election in 1860, wanted to ensure that the South were, quote, no longer equal participants in the government which they had had a full share in forming, and instead the North wanted cowardly submission to a ruler elected for no purpose but to oppress Southerners, end quote. Others commented that true patriots understood that the South needed to break away from the Union in order to ensure the continuance of the principles outlined in the Constitution. Lost Cause writers argued that their actions were patriotic, not rebellious. In the closing pages of his memoir, J. E. Roebuck confidently stated that, quote, the impartial pen of the historian will not let principles and patriotism of those who exerted themselves for the independence of the South suffer in contrast with those who took the opposite side. And then it will be written that secession was not rebellion, end quote. The lost cause interpretation of secession continues to persist into today. The standard narrative among many white Southerners is that the rupture occurred due to the issue of states' rights. While the Confederate states did maintain a states' rights philosophy, the reason for, for secession rested firmly on the desire to preserve slavery. White Southerners prior to the Civil War did not speak about forming a new country solely or even in part to affect a desired political philosophy of state sovereignty. In fact, writings ascribing secession to maintaining states' rights did not appear until after the South's military defeat when white Southerners started trying to fashion a positive social identity. At the time of secession, Mississippians were very clear of their reasons for separation when they stated in their ordinance of secession, quote, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world, end quote. Like other lost cause writers, white Mississippians extolled the virtues of the Confederate soldier and their superiority in character to that of Northern soldiers and officers. In his memoir, James Dinkins, a private in the 18th Mississippi Infantry, stated that, quote, the Confederate Army had made a name for bravery and daring for the rank and file, and genius for the leaders, that will challenge the admiration of future generations and establish a standard for emulation never to be excelled, end quote. Another infantryman, Samuel Hankins, simply claimed that, quote, the creator never made men equal to the Confederate soldier, end quote. The celebration of Confederate soldiers and officers would gloss over the large number of desertions from the Confederate ranks throughout the war. They also justified military loss on a lack of resources, being overpowered with greater numbers, and the dirty scorched earth tactics of unprincipled Northern military leaders. Despite the tumultuous period of reconstruction following the war, white Mississippians tended to portray Northerners unfavorably. The writings of, reconstruct of the reconstruction period often cast carpetbaggers who were Northerners who settled in the state after the war <clears throat> in unflattering terms and reserved their most heated vitriol at those who moved back into the Southern states in, after the war. James Dinkins did not hold back in his assessment, quote, after the war had ended, the South was overrun by a class called carpetbaggers. They were as a general and almost universal thing, the scum of the earth. Men who, except in a few instances, had no idea of right 
honesty, gentility, or decency, and knew no, and knew no such law or motto, end quote. The hatred of carpetbaggers also persisted due to the fact that most of them were, were Republican and served in political office. Once black men received the franchise, <clears throat> Republicans tended to dominate political offices in the black majority Southern states due to African-American support. For white Southerners, carpetbaggers and thus the Northern states had taken political control of the South. However, as Reconstruction ended and as white Mississippians restored <clears throat> democratic control over the state through intimidation and violence against black voters, lost cause writers turned increasingly to vilifying African-Americans. In 1874, prior to redemption in Mississippi, planter Edward Fontaine made an important observation in his journal. He spoke of black political unity and their support for the Republican Party. He predicted, though, that the racial divide would eventually benefit whites. He referred to Jamaica's Baptist War in 1831, when Samuel Sharp, a black Baptist deacon, led a rebellion of nearly 60,000 slaves against the few thousand white inhabitants of the island. Fontaine commented that the rebels, quote, forgot or knew as little of the scores of millions of whites in the vast British Empire, end quote. British forces soon swooped in and suppressed the rebellion within a few days. White reprisals on the island resulted in just over 200 insurrectionist deaths. In relaying that example, Fontaine confidently predicted that when given the choice between white or black Southerners, the rest of the nation would side with the white Southerners. Instead of continuing to blame Northerners for their misfortunes during the Civil War and Reconstruction, white Mississippian lost cause writers maligned African-Americans. The problems during Reconstruction occurred not because of Northern carpetbaggers, but because of black suffrage. Merchant and newspaper editor Horace Fulkerson succinctly described the foundation on which white Southerners sought reconciliation at the expense of black Americans. Fulkerson argued that, quote, there is an ideal American founded upon the homogeneity and assimilating qualities of the people who laid the foundation of and built up our system. The oneness of these people in their origin, diverse as they were in nationalities, in their mental training, in their historical prestige, and in their religion, fitted them for the task of founding on the shores of the new world, a great state whose power should be felt among all nations. and whose institutions should bless the whole human family, end quote. He continued to state <clears throat> that, quote, black suffrage shattered this ideal and had broken the unity in the country, end quote. His characterization of the ideal American did not include African-Americans, and further, he believed that black rights crumbled the American institutions established by the country's early founders. As the 19th century neared an end, sectional reconciliation saw some healing occur between the Northern and Southern states, but it came at a price. The rest of the nation started to adopt the major themes of the lost cause and unite with white Southerners in practices that repressed the black population. In 1890, Mississippi drafted a new state constitution with the intention to disenfranchise the state's black males and ensure white political domination. <clears throat> the final draft of the constitution imposed a $2 poll tax and a requirement that potential voters had to read a section of the constitution and provide an adequate interpretation of the passage. While these provisions did not single out black males explicitly, the amount of the poll tax was prohibitive for many black families and white males would be the ones conducting the competency test, all but ensuring black men would be declared ineligible. The new constitution also established rules with regard to segregation in public schools and other public venues. It also stated that only registered voters could sit on a jury. <clears throat> 
thus ensuring that black men and women cannot serve in this capacity. Federal courts upheld Mississippi's voting laws in a decision by the Supreme Court in 1898. Henry Williams sued the state following his, convic his conviction for murder by an all-white jury. <clears throat> Williams claimed that the state's constitution violated the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which affords the rights of citizenship and equal protection under the law. He argued that the jury was selected under discriminatory measures. The Supreme Court heard the case and declared Mississippi's voting laws constitutional, saying that on the surface, Mississippi's laws did not directly discriminate against anyone of any particular race. In many other court cases, including Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, which declared segregation constitutional, federal courts sided with discriminatory laws enacted by white Southerners. This tacit acceptance also resulted in the federal government and Northerners to ignore the brutal lynching of African Americans in the Southern states. It gave legitimacy to segregation and a white supremacist narrative that relegated black Americans to the bottom rung of the social order. As black Americans started to flee the Southern states, they met continued discrimination in Northern cities. <clears throat> the turn of the century witnessed the erection of Confederate monuments and memorials throughout Mississippi and across the South. One of the first monuments built in Mississippi and in the nation is located in Amite County and was dedicated in 1871. While some monuments honor men slain in battle, many of the monuments honored secessionists, Confederate military leaders and government officials. During the first decade of the 20th century, over 20 Confederate monuments were erected at courthouses throughout the state, while over 40 others appeared at various sites. Several roads and streets would and still bear the names of Confederate military and government leaders, with nearly half of those still retaining names not having any direct connection to Mississippi. The list of Confederate markers and symbols is still quite extensive, even after the removal or relocation of many objects. The persistence of the lost cause started to become enshrined in American culture, well outside the confines of the South. The resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s exposed the racial attitudes of millions of Americans across the country, with the Klan having a dominant presence in, the, in several states of, above the Mason-Dixon line. Movies popularized lost cause themes, such as D.W. Griffith's 1915 silent film, The Birth of a Nation, as well as Victor Fleming's 1939 movie, Gone with the Wind. Many other examples abound, but share a common tie that accepts the lost cause narratives as factual and provide a sympathetic look at white Southerners. Mississippi lost cause writers wrote their narratives with an understanding that future generations would have questions about the state's past. How would they explain slavery? How would they justify causing a war that resulted in the deaths of over 500,000 Americans? How would their children and their children's children look upon them. They needed to control the narrative. They needed to control how their history was told. In 1866, just one year after the Civil War ended, Benjamin Humphreys urged historical societies in the state to quote, preserve the memorials of the recent sanguinary struggle and preserve durable records in the form of maps, charts and diagrams of the movements and counter movements of both armies, together with the heroic part acted by our brave people. So, so it will be transmitted to posterity to whom we appeal for the vindication of the truth of history and the rectitude of our cause, end quote. In an address at Franklin Female College in Holly Springs, J.W. Clapp urged the students there to quote, see to it that our children shall not at school or at home shape their ideas or acquire their information and impressions 
from books or other sources of a character calculated to poison their minds and their hearts and teach them lessons of humiliation and shame, end quote. He continued that, quote, there is much danger unless these books are made to represent facts as they appear from a Southern standpoint, end quote. Instead, Mississippi's children should be taught, quote, to think and to feel that they are descended from an, an illustrious line of ancestry and that the noblest blood that has ever coursed through American veins has been that that was warmed by Southern sons. In fashioning the lost cause, Southerners created a version of history that fit their liking and tried to hide culpability from the shame of slavery, the decision to secede, the military defeat of the Civil War, and resistance to reconstruction and acceptance of black rights. One of the direct results of this misinformation campaign has been the adoption of this narrative into mainstream American culture and discourse. As such, it is meant that Mississippi and the South as a whole have not fully reconciled its past. It has infected the minds of generations of Americans and has placed African Americans in a detrimental position as they continue to overcome discrimination. Over time, in bits and pieces, the state has come to recognize the errors of its past as it incrementally addresses and reassesses symbols of the Confederacy and the lost cause. That process will continue, and hopefully Mississippians will be able to make sense of their past, the good and the bad, while looking toward a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was great. Can you hear us? Yes, thank you. We do have questions. Um, I'm going to dive right into them. The first, I think, has to be that you read a quote from Lost Cause writer Dunbar Rowland, who was also the founding director of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. How do you think his views on the Lost Cause affect the development of this department and the telling of Mississippi history, the official version of Mississippi history over the years? Yeah, so you see a similar um, thing play out across the South, um, kind of in the late 19th, early 20th century, where historical societies um, and are, are being formed and uh, really are trying to, I don't, I don't want it to sound like it's like this nefarious thing, but they're definitely trying to control the narrative of how their state's history is being written and portrayed. And so uh, what's interesting with uh, Roland is, is uh, if, if you look at the works of um, uh, the, that were published uh, serially, uh, he has quite a few of those articles. And a lot of them are dealing with slavery, secession, the Civil War. He's very interested, it seems, in making sure that the narrative conforms and, and goes along a certain path. And, and again, that's, that's kind of rooted in this desire to um, have something to be proud of. I mean, we, we have to understand that um, even though it was you know, a, a generation before, Southerner, white Southerners are still living with like a military defeat. They're, they're still in a position where they're trying to grapple with that fact and, and trying to piece together uh, what it means to be a Southerner and how you move forward in a nation. And he's, he's definitely instrumental again in, in kind of steering that narrative and, and um, very much aligns with traditional lost cause messaging. Mm. Why did the rest of the nation accept that last cause ideology? So that's something that's, that's uh, very interesting as well. And, and a lot of historians have written uh, quite a bit about um, Northerners accepting the lost cause. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, well, the simplest answer is it's, it's rooted in kind of this inherent racism um, that was prevalent during the, during the time period. Um, after the war, there, there's, there's kind of this sense of how do we move forward? Um, how do we um, uh, treat the South? How, you know, how, how do we make sense of everything? Um, what, what we start to see take place 
uh, again, in, in the last uh, part of, of the 19th century, is a desire to move, move past the Civil War, and it, it's during that time that Northerners are willing to accept this narrative of it was a brother's war, so that kind of becomes a common term. It, it was a brother's war, and it's more like a, a spat between two brothers, like you fight for a minute and then afterwards you hug, right? So that becomes kind of the dominant or, or, or prevailing view. And instead of a, a coming to terms that also included black Americans as part of that narrative, what we see is a lot of um, embracal of each other. So it was very common for there to be parades with former Confederate soldiers and former Union soldiers walking side by side, or sometimes you might have like brief reenactments of a war, and afterwards they shake each other's hands, again, kind of like no hard feelings, you know. Um, and and it, was, it was kind of just, it, it was easier to do that than to fully face like the horrors of slavery and accept uh, black rights and accept full black um, integration into Jewish society. Sarah Campbell asks, how do you account for the nearly universal adoption of lost cause ideologies? Were there dissenters and how did the lost cause purveyors destroy dissent? Um, that's a good question. Um, the, the lost cause so his, historians have uh, kind of more in recent years talked about the lost cause as a Southern civil religion, that it was um, much more than just kind of a set of ideas, that it, that it, it, it becomes almost embraced in, in practice. Of, of course, um, the easiest examples to dissent of, of lost cause uh, comes from the period of Reconstruction and the way that um, Southerners talked about carpetbaggers, but also talked about scalawags. So a scalawag, like a, so a carpetbagger is a northerner who came to the south after the war and settled. Um, a scalawag was a southerner who was essentially considered a traitor. Right. He was generally a Republican by choice and um, was much more willing to uh, embrace black rights and um, uh, you know, all of the changes that, that were being implemented through Reconstruction. Um, during, during Reconstruction, a lot of scalawags, they're threatened. They, they and, and even carpetbaggers, they're forced to leave. Um, you have the Ku Klux Klan, who was actively seeking out people that were supportive of Reconstruction measures. And so, um, kind of in, in just kind of a general answer to that, they're, they're not well tolerated. And uh, in, in many instances, they face physical violence and uh, death sometimes. Hmm. White Southerners, you write, thought of the heritage of the United States as their heritage, that Southerners had been fundamental in establishing and governing the nation. You talked about how the sectionalism of the Civil War and Reconstruction changed that feeling for them some during those eras. Has that feeling of Americanness by white Southerners decreased or increased in different eras and other times? Um, with, with the lost cause, it's, it's almost been kind of a, a seamless continuation in a way that um, their sense of Americanness uh, is very much tied into their Southerness. So um, what we see happen uh, during Reconstruction and the end of the 19th century is you, you start to see Southerners embrace um, Confederate leaders in the same light as they did the patriots of the American Revolution. So oftentimes when they talk about celebrating their American heritage, they put someone like Robert E. Lee up at the same level with George Washington. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, Jefferson Davis as well. They, you know, they're, they're kind of up there. Of course, Abraham Lincoln's not part of that equation, at, you know, and, and really won't be, but um, it, it kind of just becomes the smooth transition. Um, in some respects, it's almost more, um, you know, they recognize, there's more of a recognition of, I'm a Southerner first versus I'm an American first in a way, but it, it, it's such a, it was such a smooth transition for them to, to make that 
you do have by the by the early 20th century they're not so much trying to prop up their confederate leaders with national founders anymore it's just they're propping up confederate leaders yeah so <laughs> mississippi's lqc lamar is in textbooks often praised for his role in reconciling south to north following the civil war was lamar a lost cause proponent so lamar is an interesting case um and and there are other examples uh, similar to lamar who, who after the war they're wanting to uh, I, I think the reality of the situation is they recognized you've been defeated the the, the political tides are, are are um going in one direction and um the politically expedient route is to accept that to be very pragmatic about it um the the problem in doing that in in some instances was yes while you have some individuals who are quick to reconcile with the north who are quick to understand the realities of uh, the civil war its impact and reconstruction um, oftentimes, these individuals are not very quick to embrace the other changes, the social changes, political changes, with when it comes to black rights yeah. and recognizing black males now have the right to vote, or recognizing that black Americans now have full legal rights um, uh, across the nation. And so, uh, historians um, often refer to a uh, reconciliationist uh, movement that um, again is more focused on unifying the sections together the country as a whole but leaving out african americans mm -hmm. and um, you know kind of cutting them off from that that entire process and, and as a result um, there's there's not really a, a both north and south uh, the, 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 there, there's not really room for them in that narrative uh, for black americans uh, to participate in that process question from a viewer how did other institutions participate in the lost cause narrative you mentioned historians politicians educators what about the church um so going back to this idea of the lost cause being a southern civil religion um a, a, a lot of so a lot of the individuals who are involved in um, lost cause memorialization. Um, they're, they're formed as um, as uh, like historical societies or, or groups. The United Daughters of the Confederacy, probably being one of the, the largest, more more successful uh, groups. Um, when it comes to like individual churches, though, um, they're definitely participating. Uh, and 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 again, it, it becomes something that. Is, is just kind of all intertwined together. So, um, um, you know, when, when it comes to maybe one church versus another really supporting the lost cause, it's kind of just all of them, you know, all, all white churches, you know, in, embracing these ideas and participating in these events. I, I don't think that there's any divide among uh, Protestant uh, religions within the South as to, or yes, we we support the lost cause or no, we don't. You write that the, in the book that the Civil War created the first American identity for enslaved Mississippians. What did that mean for them and what did that mean for white Southerners? So I do talk about uh, the creation of a, a black identity um, and that process really kind of stemmed from um, identity formation prior to the Civil War. After, after the Civil War, so during the period of Reconstruction, um, black Americans are given voting rights. They're given uh, the rights to uh, legal equality. And they're able to participate in American institutions for the first time. And um, initially, they are uh, very actively involved in, in doing so. Uh, black voter participation uh, in Mississippi was, uh, it, it hovered around 90% for most of the period of Reconstruction. They are engaged. They're voting, they're campaigning, they're you know, you know, making sure that people who, for the most part, have their interests in mind are being elected to office. Um, and so they do start to fashion 
their own identity as I'm an American. Um, unfortunately, that kind of it's 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 almost ripped away from them as white Mississippians start to reassert political control using violence and intimidation to prevent prevent blacks from voting. To the point that African Americans then were having to kind of readjust or reshift their thinking of what it means to them to be an American because suddenly the rights that they had had been given during Reconstruction were, were taken away. And and really it's it's been a consistent fight um, since that period of time. And, and we're talking well into the 21st century uh, that that fight is continuing of what it means to be um, uh, a black person living in the United States, what, what does that mean to you as um, identifying as an American? And um, I, I think there's, there's plenty of good along with, with the bad that's, that's there, but it's, it's still a process where it's evolving. Mike Fitzwilliam asks, has anyone studied a potential correlation between slave ownership and owners being white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, that is, religious descendants of Scots and Brits? <laughs> um, so, yes, there, there are um, a lot of, of studies um, about that. One of the best uh, is by David uh, Hackett Fisher. Uh, he wrote, it's, it's an enormous uh, book called All the Unseed, in which he traces um, uh, a lot of the, um, he, he traces what he calls four major folkways uh, coming into the United States and uh, where they came from in England, where they settled in the United States. Um, and of course, he's, within his book, he's primarily focused on those coming from, um, from Britain. Um, but there's definitely some truth to the fact that, that uh, a lot of those that settled in the South came from um, the same places in England, Scotland, Ireland, you know, uh, settled. Um, but the idea of what historians refer to as the Cavalier myth, that all Southerners came from aristocratic roots, that they were the former nobles of, you know, old England, um, that's more dubious, and um, again, of course you have some, but for the most part, most of the people that settled in, in what would become the United States, they're from the middling classes, yeah. they're, you know, well enough to afford a passage across the Atlantic, but they're not the upper crust, they're, you know, they're, uh, so, um, but again, all beyond seeds, uh, if you're interested, that's, that's the work to really consult. Avery Rollins asks, can you comment on the 20 slave law and how the poor whites fought the rich whites war? Absolutely, yeah. So um, one of the things that the lost cause tries to downplay or really doesn't address at all is really the, there, there wasn't unanimous firm support in the South among white Southerners during the Civil War for the actual war itself. Uh, the Confederate government made a lot of, of major mistakes, major miscalculations. Um, the, the 20 Negro law that was referenced uh, stated that if you own 20 or more slaves, essentially you're, you're not eligible for the draft. You don't have to worry about having to fight the Civil War. Um, and so there, there was a, a common saying among Southerners, um, white Southerners who were fighting in the war that it was a rich man's war, poor man's fight, that those that had the most to lose from the Civil War were the ones staying at home and not having to wage or, or, or really sacrifice much in the, in the conflict. Instead, it was on, on the backs of uh, common uh, whites who were mostly non-slaveholders, um, had no vested interest one way or the other uh, with regard to slavery. Um, and so during the war, what, what, that, what that leads to is you, have, you do have a lot of desertions during the war, so you have a lot of Confederate soldiers who, um, if, if they, especially after a loss, if they lose a battle, they're just like, whatever, I'm going back home. A lot of them receive letters from home saying, we're starving, we need you to work the farm. 
choosing between uh, a, a cause that's to preserve slavery versus feeding their family, they're going to go feed their family. So um, again, lost cause writers don't talk about that. That's not that's not something that is that appears in their in their works. But definitely, if you go back and you look at soldiers' letters during the war itself and the conflict that's posed to them of please come home versus this supposed glorious cause of, of Southern independence, um, that they're, they're wrestling with that during the conflict quite often. This may be the last question we have time for. It reminds me <clears throat> of the passage in the book where you talk about the, um, the struggle over the use of specific terms in the, you know, aftermath, whether it's going to be referred to as a rebellion or a civil war. The question is, the lost cause is an excellent example of the importance of language and the context in which words are used. You acknowledge the difficulty of debunking all the myths in the writings you cite. What advice do you have for public historians who interpret this period? For example, using words like redemption. Yeah, so when it, when it comes to, uh, you know, creating um, a social identity, uh, as you mentioned, words are important, and the way you speak about something is very important. So for a lot of Southerners, um, using phrases such as uh, the, the war of northern aggression, for instance, uh, makes it appear as though they're the victims of a northern effort to suppress the South. Um, referring to it as a brother's war is another way to uh, minimize the impact or, or, or the, the, the full scope of what the Civil War was. Um, politicians are great at doing this. We see it all the time in terms of messaging. You know, um, to one side will label another with, with certain uh, characteristics and uh, it works. It, it, it sticks and it works. Um, it, it's, it's not something invented by lost cause writers. It's something that humans have probably been doing since the dawn of time. Um, and, and so uh, when, when people look at the writings of this period, you will see those patterns of specific phrases or wording that's being used to convey a certain idea. And, and again, oftentimes, that language is used to either victimize Southerners um, or to deflect blame elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so uh, rebellion is not a word that you would see often in Lost Cause Right. They want to avoid that word rebellion um, until a time when it becomes acceptable to be known as a rebel. Mm -hmm. So um, when it's tied into the, the, you know, the Southern identity. Um, but, uh, uh, again, language is, is important, the way it's presented is important, and uh, the way it's used to convey uh, identity is important. Uh, we don't really have time for more questions, but I hate not to pass along Sherry Lovelace's. Uh, she asks if you could repeat the name of the book that you had just mentioned. She had written down all the, and I guess this was in response to, yeah. It's uh, David Hackett Fisher, all beyond seed. And did you say that was from Sherry Loveless? Yes. Sherry, I'll email that to you. I'll email you the title. <laughs> <laughs> better and better. Well, we've come to the top of another hour. Thank you all for watching this program. Remember to join us next week for History's Lunch and Rick Gruber's discussion of artist Dusty Bonger. Don't forget tomorrow's program uh, on women's suffrage with Marjorie Spool on the Museum of Mississippi History's Facebook page. Plus, there's a new Speaking of Mississippi podcast episode up that explores the short documentary films of Wilma Mosley Clopton. Once again, though, thank you, Mike Goldman, for this look into the origins of Mississippi's lost cause mythos. We look forward to more from you in the future. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.